Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hopefully, and as people join in, um, you know, we'll that we'll take a little bit to do some introductions before so we should have enough time. I just want to remind everyone that has called in to go ahead and mute your microphone. Um, and if you want to not share video, then that's fine as well. Um, we're going to be uh, projecting the presentation so there wouldn't be an opportunity for a video exchange. Um, so I'm Jennifer Caldwell. I'm the chair of TTWG. And I thank you for joining us today to learn about interagency Edison, iEdison. Um, that is um, presented by John um, Salzman from NIH. First, before we begin, I want to introduce the executive board for TTWG. So we have on with us today Elsie Quait Randall, who's our vice chair, Jennifer Lee, who's our recording secretary, and Cherry Schmidt, who's our past chair of TTWG. And we wanted to um, do a little bit of housekeeping to begin with. And I'm gonna turn it over to Elsie to talk about our committees and your interest in joining. Hi there, Elsie. I hope, uh, yeah, can you hear me, Jen? Yes. Yes, okay. Hi everyone, good morning. Thanks for joining um, our, our webinar today. Um, I just wanted to um, do a quick call for the sort of committees that we have um, to see um, who would be interested in participating. I know several of you have mentioned both to Jan, Jan and I, um, that uh, your, your willingness to participate, um, but we're sort of, we, we need to sort of have confirmation because we can't remember which committee some people volunteered for already. So forgive us on that one. Um, there's been a lot going on. Um, so the Member Services Committee, as you are all aware, is chaired by Jan Lee at Pacific Northwest. Um, she's the one that looks after all of our members and, and makes sure that we um, we keep everything um, running. The metrics committee this year, um, Wendy Skinner from INL um, has volunteered to chair that committee. Um, and also we have a couple of folks, Clara and Charlie from OTT, um, have offered to participate as well as Marianne um, from Los Alamos and Lee from NNSA. So the metrics committee, as you know, is required and we always have a metrics committee. The subcommittees um, are chosen every year based on um, what the membership would like to see tackled in the following year. So some um, you know, issues that we feel as, as the lab system need to be addressed. And so um, last year, the subcommittee subjects were decided upon, um, resource requirements, training, um, and best practices, sort of royalty rates and credit terms. Um, resource requirements, um, Hamant from ANL very, very kindly um, offered to chair that. We did have a discussion at Oak Ridge. Um, Suzanne Stora here at Berkeley and Nestor from Oak Ridge have joined that subcommittee. Training, um, Diane Hart from Argonne, um, together with Cherry, who um, has much, much more wisdom, I think, than all of us put together. Um, has offered to develop a training strategy um, for, for our, our, our staff. And then the royalty rates and credit terms, that was we wanted to develop um, a database of royalty rates, for example, like the Autumn, um, the Autumn, whose name escapes me now, um, their royalty database where universities can go and look and see what you know um, industry standard academic royalty rates may be. Um, also, LES has something. And then with I Edison, I believe that I Edison report. But I haven't. Uh -uh. And then the um, the credit terms, um, there was some um, idea that we, we all wanted to understand what flexibility we had in some credit clauses. Um, and so that um, subcommittee will be looking at those two things. Um, Anne Miller and I think Eric Payne from NREL have. Um, offered to um, our volunteers to chair that and at the minute and um, we have Catherine who's a licensing person from Berkeley on that committee. So I would sort of ask um, could everyone take a look at those subcommittees and see if anyone has any interest um, and if so please get in touch with either myself or Jen or Jen or indeed the, directly with the chair of that subcommittee. Um, with that I think we're ready to roll with I Edison. Great. Thank you, Elsie. Um, so today we're excited to learn about the Interagency Edison, iEdison, 
who's, um, we're going to learn about this from John Salzman. And so, so we're going to give control over to John so he can share his um, slide deck. But before, I would like to make a proper introduction. So John is the Assistant Extramural Inventions Policy Officer and Information Technology Policy Analyst in the Office of Policy for Extramural Research Administration, OPERA, at NIH. He's worked in the area of invention and patent reporting compliance and implementing federal regulations using computer systems since 1997. He conducts public sessions on regulatory compliance and further agency coordination in these areas. He's responsible for managing the data and deriving reports, documenting the process, I'm sorry, the progress of NIH in reaching its policy objectives for inventions and patent reporting. He's previously worked in computer systems and network support at NIH. He has a variety of degrees, including a master's degree in public management from the University of Maryland, a master's in community planning, and a master's in computer science from American University. It is my pleasure to invite John to uh, present to us today, I. Edison. Thanks very much. I think I'm on now. Um, so is my screen now live? Um, we're still waiting for you to share. And I as I think you have to release because uh, I didn't unshare, if you recall. Okay. I did unshare. So we well, I can click on share screen if you'd like. And as John is doing this, I'd like to remind everyone that if you have questions during John's presentation, please email it to ttwg at ornl.gov, and this is listed at the bottom of his slides. And then we'll um, take those questions at the end for John to address. And if you have joined us since we started, please remember to mute your microphone so it doesn't interfere with the presentation. All right. Uh, can everyone see the uh, first slide? Yes. All right. Okay. All right. I guess I'll begin. Um, most of this is uh, going to be a, a bit of a background as to why I started Edison and I tried to keep it fairly high level with a lot of emphasis on background, how we got here, and a high level overview. Um, I can answer any questions at the end, and I can also do a live demonstration as well if anyone has any questions about that. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction. I always wince when I think of how long I've been here. Uh, I think I've been here too long, uh, but I don't know. I uh, I've enjoyed it, and I've seen everything come a long way. And I hope to, in the first couple of slides, um, to show how how why we did this, and um, to basically, hopefully, we can share the um, the same objective. So let me go ahead and get started. Um, now, Edison got started in around 1995, give or take a bit. And how did we handle things before that? Well, I can say we handled them on paper with um, elegantly filed um, invention disclosures and associated patents the old-fashioned way in a room full of filing cabinets. And as in existence at the time, uh, pre didol under HEW, that is the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, as we were known before the Education Reorganization Act of 1978, when all the institutional patent agreements at HH, or, excuse me, HEW had at the time about 75 research universities and occasional affiliated patent management organizations with customized terms. We had um, local databases at the time. These were being gotten rid of when I arrived here. I don't quite date back this far, almost. Um, and uh, one of them was actually very close to what DOE currently names PATMIS as one of the databases they use. Ours was PMIS and Reflex, and also a large number of Excel spreadsheets. That was before a number of things happened. The first thing that happened was an Office of Inspector General audit uh, that basically took a look at our oversight of grantees' compliance. Um, most of our R&D is done by grants, but still we have a, a significant amount of research contracts as well, primarily clinical trials. And the purpose of this report was to review our re requirements with the Patent and Trademark Amendments Act uh, by Dole. And what did they find at the conclusion? Well, 
NIH lacks a systematic process for ensuring that grantees submit all required invention information. These are all quotes. The NIH does not fully utilize its invention database to monitor grantee compliance. And the NIH should add more detailed licensing and utilization information to its invention database and use the database to track grantees for timely compliance. The data could be aggregated periodically and used to gauge progress in commercializing NIH-supported inventions. Uh, at the time, uh, NIH was essentially a two-person office. It was DEIR instead of DEITR. Uh, the T actually was Edison. Um, and those two people did their very best to try to manage on paper all the compliance coming in for inventions. Uh, we had a mere 1,500 or to 800 inventions under extramural grants, contracts, cooperative agreements, et cetera, at the time. It's um, far in excess of that today. Uh, at the conclusion of the response to this not exactly um, favorable NIH report, um, the last footnote, which is the last paragraph, the last appendix at the bottom of the last page in small print, was NIH intends to establish an electronic means to transfer information between an institution and NIH effective in fiscal year 1997. And these are all quotations from the report and the response, which are all available online. And essentially, that is the reason. Um, when they did a follow-up in 1998, which still found additional difficulties, this was a re-audit of university and, universities and a report to congressional committees. The citation here was probably the most aggressive system for monitoring by Dole was NIH. October of 1995, we deployed Edison for managing its, um, our intellectual property. And we did design it, at least in part, to respond to criticism from the OIG that it was not pro properly documenting reporting under the Act. Uh, essentially, by administration of the Patent Rights Clause and ensuring appropriate follow-up by government patent personnel, I believe is almost a verbatim quote as what the FAR said, at least at one point, putting them in a room full of filing cabinets was not what they had in mind. And so we built Edison and got started. The, I really sorry, did I miss something? No, I thought I heard someone talking. I'm, it's okay to ask questions. Um, the basic purpose of Edison is the administration of the Patent Rights Clause. So what we're trying to do is document the discoveries made under federal sponsorship uh, to, al to allow the retention of all re reporting rights and to ensure that we the, the contractor pursues the commercialization and licensing and industrial partnerships, which you do already, but that we can, in fact, report and manage it in a, in a way that the volume can be used, the data to basically drive reports and trends and tracking to show from those who award us our funding the progress and to tie them back to the scientific programs that fund them. In a nutshell, this is one of the oldest slides we had. The director made it about 20 years ago. He was a PowerPoint animation wizard. Is that what NIH is trying to do by Edison, and by extension all of the other agencies that work with us, is to track the process under Bayh-Dole for technology commercialization over a very long period of time, over 20 years. And we do this by collecting the initial disclosure, determining what fraction of those have title elected, collect confirmatory license and portions of the patent application documenting the sources of funding. And at least at NIH, and there's a different discussion about this relation to DOE for utilization reporting, as the activity of products and like product development and commercialization and licensing and so forth go on over this period of time. This is essentially what we're trying to do in a, a high-level view with Edison. In terms of recipients and who reports under any prime award or R&D subcontract flow-down provisions, it's always the employer of the inventor that handles the reporting back to the agency. And so in very large awards that have multi-tiered subcontracts, which we don't tend to do as much of at NIH, but other agencies do very much, DOD and DOE, it's just to identify who the obligations are on. In the case of co-funding, there's a way to address that in Edison that we can talk about. 
a little while later. Uh, the recipient process, at least this is how it works at NIH, is that the initial organization awards the research funds. The, the uh, recipient organization gives money to the principal investigators who discover the inventions. It all flows back to the technology transfer office responsible for licensing, who then reports its progress, patent development, and what is happening with commercialization through utilization reporting, if required, back to NIH. And we have, as part of our own utilization reporting, any FDA-approved drugs and commercial products that we added to Edison on request from the office of Senator Wyden um, some years ago, who was interested in university progress toward drug development. The basic structure of Edison, this is just a very high-level view. Um, when I get to the end, we can do any live demonstration that you'd like, and I have some screenshots at the end of this uh, presentation. Uh, the recipient, the performer of the R&D, makes an invention report in Edison, fills in some fields, and attaches the detailed enabling technical description, and then reports any patent or PVP applications that may come along. Uh, PVPs are Plant Variety Protection Act, and they count as subject inventions as well for agricultural-oriented institutions, even though they're not patents at all. But I'll just move on from that. NIH does not fund them, but it's a large business at USDA. The basic elements that we collect in Edison for the data involving a subject invention is the date of disclosure, that is the date it was reported promptly to the technology licensing office by the employee, the title, the inventors, and the sources of agency funding. Uh, one of the things that Edison tries to do is to keep multiple agencies all up to speed at the same time. So in the case of co-funding organizations, I know this happens with some DOE labs, for example, NIH has given funding to, I believe, um, Lawrence Berkeley, Lawrence Livermore, Los Alamos, and I think on occasion Brookhaven, if I'm not mistaken. There were a few at least, and I believe Oak Ridge as well. I'm not certain. But NIH has given funding. And I know other government agencies also give money to national labs. I believe DHS has mentioned that to me as well. And they're in Edison also. So. Uh, since Edison's all compartmentalized, uh, agencies see where their funding goes. That one invention report citing a source from DOE as well as from DHS and from NIH would be available for viewing to the agencies that funded it, of course, but only managed by the primary agency as specified in Edison. Uh, if agencies disagree about that, then they can discuss that among themselves because the regulation does specify that only one agency is to represent the interests of the government uh, in the technology and deal with the contractor. So the contractor does not have to deal for any matters covered by the clause with approvals from multiple agencies, even in the case of inventions and related patents funded by multiple government agencies or departments. We do validate the funding agreements in an effort to keep a high data quality, both on the invention report as well as on the patent report. Um, we try to validate number fields, sources of funding, award formats, the order of precedence in terms of a patent prosecution that I'll get to as it's reported to try to improve data quality and minimize errors so that we can obviously try to draw inferences from the good data that we collect. And if a funding agreement isn't working, all an agency has to do is let us know, and we can add it in. Occasionally, grant and contracting offices change the award permutations from time to time. Uh, for DOE, I know that uh, for certain national laboratory contracts that still have the original Manhattan Project contract number, I think it's WENG740582, I think some of the, the very oldest laboratory contracts, I believe, operate under that numbering format until renewed. And so those are still valid in Edison as well. Uh, basically, the EIR is the, the uh, term that's abbreviation that's used. It's a subject invention. It stands for a grantee or contractor employee's invention report. It covers resulting patent applications. It's a conceptual concept. It doesn't live at the patent office just under the funding agreement. 
It covers utilization reporting as well, which I'll get to. And inventions may also be combined. So for example, if you have a patent or plant variety protection application that in the course of patent prosecution is discovered to have been funded by more than one grantor or contractor employee invention report, the employee invention reports in Edison will begin to generate reminder messages asking you know, where your time frame is coming up, why haven't you elected title, where is your uh, you know, invention detail, where's your initial patent application, and so forth. And to avoid that in the course of patent prosecution, if more than one invention is combined into a single patent application, the invention reports may be linked in this way so that each one is reflective of the scientific funding that generated it, and they both indicate that they are combined to lead to a patent or plant variety protection application. Patent records in Edison are fairly similar to the invention. They reflect the stages and types of applications, provisional, non-provisional, all the various types, utility, continuation, divisional, continuation in part, file wrapper continuation, continuing prosecution application, and request for continuing evaluation that replaced them. Um, I wish they'd kept file wrapper, actually, because they, they share patent numbers. That made our database more complex, CPAs and RCEs. Uh, platin, uh, sorry, plant reissue and design patents and applications as well. Foreign filings, if allowed, indications of uh, some, some basic information, which countries and if they're active or abandoned in the last date, and of course, any patent issuances that come along. The patent records also link to each other, so each patent record is reflective of each office action that generates a fresh application number. Then each one is linked to each other in a chain. They can divide to reflect multiple or potential multiple issuances. Uh, they enforce, Edison enforces unique patent application numbers to eliminate the possibility of duplicate reports. Um, one thing I've found is that often when trying to enter an application number in an organization or institution is told it's not there, available to be entered because it's there already, uh, they often discover that a collaborating organization, one of the PIs employed somewhere else who's party to a funding agreement for R&D related work, has already put it in Edison. And they often then discover that the inventions need to be combined and agreement for who is going to handle the patent prosecution to be made and their provisions in Edison so that one organization will handle the compliance reporting and the other institution may see what they are doing and watch but not edit shared on an individual patent and or patent application basis. It's that granular uh, so that the one institution, so that both may of course fill out their final invention statement, or excuse me, patent certification document and with confidence that the reporting indicated on it is being done. It is just being done by um, the other party. One. So this is, a, again, a very simple structure. I have some screenshots at the end uh, for the subject invention report at the beginning with a patent application, a mere two, which then proceeds to issue uh, the third um, office action. Uh, you may, and this would also be indicated if a child invention were combined effectively with a parent subject invention report, then generally the earlier disclosed invention would be the parent so that the regulatory time frame is worked properly and that would then lead to the patent applications and, and as such link all of the science awards and appropriate inventors down to the patent prosecution and issuance and licensing activity thereof. If a licensing activity is asked at uh, DOE, and this is a, a separate discussion that uh, Edison or that DOE is having about some possible modifications, I believe cert, well, I'll get to utilization in a, in a later slide. But at, a, at least if you have any NIH-funded uh, inventions anywhere, and there are some at DOE laboratories, then we do ask for utilization data, and I have a, a slide on that at the end. It's relatively generic. Uh, the whole point of this is to electronically manage the process, as indicated in the OAG report that we received, to maintain the patent rights or to let the government know uh, not less than 30 days in advance if we are, the agency may elect title to any patent. To, there is, of course, some pending regulatory changes. Um, that is, I, I don't know what's going on with that. That's all being handled by the Department of Commerce through the um, 
uh, public uh, comment process. But that's that's all held up. I'm not sure what's happening with it. So until that happens, if anything happens with it, the old rules continue. Um, alert the government to any public use or publication affecting the subject invention. We ask about any publications or presentations as part of the invention report. To monitor filing the confirmatory licenses, which we then record, Executive Order 9424, and include an acknowledgment of the government's rights in the text when you supply us with copies of the applications. Just a word about NIH utilization reporting, um, but as I can come down to the screenshots and, and the end of the overview. Uh, we identify commercialization activities in progress, basically that's what we're trying to achieve. We ask for a one-year snapshot of the data, the status of the commercialization in terms of its latest stage of development using a very simple metric, commercialized or licensed or not, the date of first commercial sale or use, the number of licenses and the type that it is, a total income from royalty or option agreements collected during that year, and the commercial names of any FDA-approved products. I believe there's a discussion going on with this at DOE, and I'm not authoritative on any specific things related to DOE, so I may get some specific terms that I've heard mentioned. I may miss some nuances. Um, but as far as I know, I think certain components of DOE, I think ARPA-E perhaps, and maybe ERE, energy efficiency, I believe, um, ask for utilization reporting, but they ask for it in a slightly different format, and I believe with a narrative explanation. Um, and I think that's under discussion as to what uh, what he wishes to do with that. And I believe they collect it using an appendix. I think it's on paper. I'm not certain. But not for NIH utilization reporting on inventions in Edison that do not cite NIH funding at this time. Uh, essentially, the reminder messages that Edison has within it, at least some of them, um, and the requirements for grantees and contractors, obviously the employee agreements for research employees, disclosing the invention, resolve election, a waiver of title, or within uh, nine months for certain contracts under the FAR supplements, file a non-provisional patent application within a year of electing title, or within 10 months of a provisional application under only under contracts, and I give the FAR citation there, it was in, inserted in December 2008 and was retained at the recent revision of the FAR in, I believe, 2014 or 15. The GSA called me, I think, for some questions about the patent rights clause as they were doing the renewal, I think, last year. Uh, so that is a, a deviation that sometimes people are not aware of. Um, collects licenses to the government, and this will prompt you if it's not submitted, and the same with uh, supplying copies of the patent application. Requiring product manufacturing in the U.S., and I believe in accord with DOE's industrial competitiveness policy as well. And the DOE invention or patent certification is reconciled all right, with the uh, data in Edison uh, annually in a closeout to try to ensure that what has happened to us, myself personally at NIH, is they got uh, the, the General Accounting Office received data from the uh, patent office about inventions that had no licenses but cited federal funding, and it asked us as well, compared the two, and asked us to explain the discrepancies. Uh, it was um, an interesting endeavor. Um, we're trying to keep that from, from occurring. Um, we try very much, it hasn't had some updates in recent years, but still works fairly well, to handle bulk uploads from local databases at organizations that have their own, that they, they've taken time to build uh, their own IP management systems. I think uh, Harvard built something called Jake. I think MIT has one called Co Coeus or Forrester. I'm not, I'm not certain. Um, and there also are some commercial uh, databases that uh, companies sell to technology management offices that have built Edison compatibility. And there is a standard integrator format. It's open source, of course, um, for anyone that wishes to export data from their own local databases to have it put right in to Edison directly. So if there are any local databases, that value of that data can be uh, leveraged. It's just a standard tag field value pair format in a text file, and it's uh, loaded in through an encrypted website. Or Edison's all encrypted, by the way, given the nature of the information. That just goes without saying in this area. Everything is encrypted, everything. Um, and Essentially, these uh, external databases, if you want to do uploads, we um, 
you know, are com compatible with uh, external uh, generated uh, digital certificates for encryption standards, uh, whether you use ones that uh, DOE provides, I think they have their own certificate authority, or if you buy external ones, that may all be used as well. And then just uh, two slides, I think, at the, at the very end, um, what's the end result? I mean, basically, agencies, or their co-funded inventions, all receive their notifications made under their funding agreements for discoveries linked to their programs by their award number. This shows collaborative funding to agencies because the overlap of funding between different agency programs is itself a matter of interest. Um, and in addition, uh, we can then track, for example, and report on and monitor by individual scientific and program area the number of discoveries, uh, the number of those that are then elected title to, the ones that generate patent activity, the ones with the patent activity issued, and if the patent does issue, how long it's maintained and whether or not it's licensed and generates private sector commercialization revenue via the utilization reports. It's really our attempt at generating our own version on a longitudinal basis, given how long the data collection takes, some 20 to 30 years, uh, of a version of the autumn annual report, um, which has proved very useful. I've seen it uh, given at autumn uh, sometimes and been to the autumn annual meeting a couple of times, presented there as well. And, of course, it allows us to demonstrate the value at agencies, because so it's a collaborative, symbiotic relationship between NIH and its grantees and contractors to show the value of the research grant and contract programs that we end, or that we fund. And so that is the end, I think, of my little introductory history and overview. I have a few screenshots of Edison, and I then can do a live demo if anyone has any questions in any way whatsoever. Um, but basically, this is what Edison looks like, some just very basic screens. When you're looking for inventions, there are reporting numbers, which is the number that we, gen I'm sorry, that we generate. Uh, the docket number is intended for uh, compatibility with any laboratory or institution's own system so that you may use it. Typically, is the case number for an invention disclosure, and usually the patent docket number normally matches the attorney docket number if the case is being prosecuted by outside counsel. Invention titles, keywords, inventor names. You can have 20 inventor names. Uh, grantee organization, if you wish to search for. For example, if certain organizations are sharing certain subsets of patent activity with you because of co-funding, then, of course, you may look for all those by that. Otherwise, it's limited, of course, to the institution. The invention status, elect title, and so forth. And there's a spot for the DOES number, just to be compatible with their long-standing docketing system. Uh, when the inventions are initially put in here, I think uh, Edison generates a T number, which was intended T for temporary long ago, um, at the request of um, uh, Paul Gottlieb. And um, so Ed, do we know that if they ever see a T number, it means there's a new invention created that needs to have a T changed to an S. They thought that was amusing when they first created it, but we didn't know what else to do. Uh, this is an indication of a child invention in the way I had just described. Uh, this would be the one made parent to the other, an amendment to the invention, therefore basically creating a combined invention. And this is a two distinct patents. They are not linked to each other, but they are all obviously underneath the subject invention that gave rise to them. It can get more complex than that if you have multiple patent prosecutions within a single invention. Uh, this is just a test record that we've made, obviously, but you can see the prosecution heading down. This could be perhaps one issuance, and another one could be down here at the bottom. And then these other patents are not yet linked in. And essentially, this is just an indication that you can also link RCEs. They all have the same patent number, but the database is aware that despite sharing the same non-provisional patent application number, they're all linked in order. This is some of the patent-specific search criteria. It should all look fairly standard. The docket number, the non-provisional application number, the patent title, name, dates, and then you can search for patents by their parent invention criteria, including the funding agreement as well. And this is a search result when you, for example, done a search and you wish to um, get your result. And you may 
click on to open the precise record, including document attachments, including the application itself and any supplemental correspondence related to the record can be had by clicking on this link here, which is, I can't bring it up this time, but I will if I want to see it. This is a uh, test institution. Dan is the name of the original programmer, and so we've made sure that he remains famous forever. And that is it for the slideshow. I'm happy to do any kind of a live demonstration should anyone wish to see it or to have any questions. I hope I wasn't too terribly boring, and I hope that it was useful as a, as a basic overview. This is the initial login page, and this is what the front page looks like. And these are the current agencies that um, participate um, with us. So, for example, everybody here is, um, you know, the various different uh, components around the government. Uh, DOE is in here somewhere. Um, uh, where is, ah, here it is. And there's Maritza Rodriguez in DOE Chicago, and uh, Marianne Lynch, I believe, is handling um, RPE. This, these are under agency control. They can modify them uh, at any time to update them for different reasons. And they're and that's it for me, so I'll be happy to take any questions, and I hope I haven't bored you too terribly much, and I hope that it was useful. But I thought people want to know, you know, often wonder why did NIH do this, and I thought I would lie out or lay out the exact reasons as to why we did. Great, John. That's it. Thank you so I hope much. that was what you were looking for. It was. It was a great um, overview and introduction into the system. We do have some questions that have come through that I'm going to ask now. Um, can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah, that's fine. I'm 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 just sitting here on like I'm on a normal phone call. That's that you told me was much better than the speakerphone. So go right ahead. Great. Well, we have a question from Fermilab. Um, does NIH also track invention disclosures under CRADAs in I Edison, or is it only used for funding or agreements? Actually, uh, let me. You can still see my screen. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Let me just pull up an invention here under our bogus institution. This is the test purpose one. And let me see if there is one in here for DOE. Ah, yes, we've been making test records. Uh, bread thinly sliced, let's open this one. We have added, and they're visible at the agency side, not yet to the external side, some additional fields at the request of DOE as we migrate the data for their internal database into Edison. One of them is prime or sub, and the other is, um, I forget what on earth that stands for, uh, CRADA, contract, cooperative agreement, grant, uh, other, if you pick other, actually, after if you pick other, not other transaction, the other award, you know, whatever it is comes up, then other transaction and then work for others. Um, so there is uh, clearly a desire, I believe, on the part of DOE and possibly others, it's agency discretion, to do those as well. And I believe as they're entered in here, I believe DOE is going in, Maritza, or, or, I believe, and identifying the agreement type. It doesn't have any function at this point. It will show up if they do it. But the idea is that, yes, the messages could be customized to uh, accommodate stevenson Widler, which takes preference over Bidol, if applicable, for any award that contributes to an extramural subject invention that is also funded via CRADA or customized agreement in another transaction or work for others or something like that. So the answer is they are making provision for it. I do not know if they are directing it, but it looks like, as far as I can tell, they want to go that way because these were added at the request of DOEOGC. Great. And then the uh, same question from that laboratory is, if a DOE lab wants to use iEdison for all of its reporting to the government, DOE and others, can we? And is there a fee? What? Uh, yes. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, well, first off, no, no fee. That, that's, that, uh, I, okay. That, no, it's free. It, it's, <laughs> no, nothing. Um, it's it's we couldn't really require uh, a fee. It's Edison's uh, Edison is the means uh, of communicating with the government for the um, the patent rights clause. I mean, we, there's never been any charge whatsoever. It's a government service. It's included. Um, uh, we simply at NIH at least um, w were not cannot handle mail reporting. I'm I'm the only one around here that remembers um, what it was like. 
Um, and it was stacks of inventions that were feet high. Um, it's, it was impossible. So no, there's no fee. And yes, for all of the agencies that have agreed to use Edison, after all, they have to agree. Um, and if they don't agree, then um, you know, then I, I what I tell everyone is, uh, if you have an invention that's solely funded by the somebody who doesn't, uh, uh, oh NASA, that's probably the biggest example. NASA has the NASA has their own. They, they do their own thing. They always have ever since back 20 years. They just they're they're unique in this regard. And so with NASA or anyone else, uh, unless they have a specifically defined system, and I think NASA has a kind of partial paper, partial. I, I'm not sure what it is. Um, then I tell everyone to put it into an envelope, label it as to what it is, um, or seal it up, put that envelope into another envelope, and ship it by recorded delivery, registered mail or courier, I suppose, to the contracting officer or grants management specialist responsible for the award. So unless they have given other instructions in the award, as far as I am aware, by the book, that is the procedure for handling all matters under the Patent Rights Clause, unless directed otherwise. And if you do that, as far as I know, you will always be safe. Um, so, But for the ones in Edison, yes, absolutely. Um, I don't know... I mean, all of these, for example, various parts of the Army and DOD, DITRA, that's Defense Threat Reduction Agency, DARPA, the A A International Trade Administration, the Department of Agriculture, um, Agricultural Research Service, the Forest Service, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, that's the former Cooperative State Research Education and Extension Service. Believe it or not, the Indian Health Service had an invention, EPA. A Department of Transportation, um, I think several components within there, the um, University Business uh, Research Program, program SBIR, the Federal Railroad Administration, yes, quite a number. And for all of them, I, you should. They, they, want, they want you to, and, and so do we. Um, in fact, we've been, we, we began absolutely insisting without, without any equivocation whatsoever uh, within the past uh, year, but to my experience, no one has ever really needed any encouragement because the effort and the expense needed to ship by mail copies of all patent applications and um, invention disclosures with attachments and cover letters for each one uh, is extraordinarily time-consuming and expensive in postage, if nothing else. So we really never even had to insist. People generally were very happy. That was our – that was my, my experience. Um, and I can't imagine people feel differently. I hope John, that's a good answer. No, that's great. And John, we have actually quite a few um, questions to go through, so I'm going to start jumping through them for you. Oh, sorry, yes. Please go ahead. Um, but we do have quite a bit of questions. Um, the next question comes from EERE DOE. Um, what type, that's energy efficiency, renewable energy. What type of analysis does NIH currently do on the iEdison data? That's the first of the three questions. Well, what we're trying to do right now is to attempt to – what we're reconciling is people who have gotten patents and who have cited NIH sources of funding um, without doing the required reporting is one aspect. Uh, second, to identify people who have – who are not meeting the Bayh-Dole timelines in terms of title election and are letting – the opportunity for filing a patent either expire or more likely not following through on it. Uh, those that have, uh, and in, in doing that, we intend to derive reporting in terms of productivity or in terms of responses to congressional inquiries or things like that. Uh, it is generally output measurement in terms of, uh, in some cases, dollar amounts of royalty and licensing revenue grouped by scientific program, grouped by institutions, so that different recipients who might have a specific expertise in a particular area of disease research could then be compared over time. We've had inquiries along those lines, and of course, mapping it to, um, of course, patent issuances down the road. That's one thing that we, uh, we are trying to do with it at present. But it, it's all predicated upon getting solid data quality before, of course, it has the, the ability to be analyzed. Sure. 
Um, the second of the three questions from EERE is what type of enforcement process does NIH have for non-compliant awardees? Is it through iEdison or an outside system? Well, at the moment, under the current regulations, if you're talking about enforcement through the patent rights clause of the revocation of ownership of a patent for failure to comply with the regulations, and that is by issuing a written request for conveyance of title, which if I find it here, request for, um, yeah, if you mean these particular provisions where the contractor will convey to the federal agency, um, we have a, um, let's see, if the contractor fails to disclose or elect within the time specified above, uh, with, uh, provided within 60 days, which is a very short time frame. Uh, if you mean that, uh, you must send a written request, at least at present. And I do not believe that written request is part of the provision for electronic filing which allows for certain other reports. I believe this may be updated in the future um, because obviously sending letters is not ideal, but, uh, but at the moment it can't really be done solely through Edison because of the requirement to send a demand letter. However, in Edison, uh, it certainly could be indicated and tracked because when you are looking at an invention report, um, go back to where I was. I can, this doesn't always work the best when you hit the back button. Uh, one of the statuses which I did not get to is march in enacted, which obviously means the government marched in, or the government takes title, which uh, can be changed in Edison to indicate that if such an action uh, is taken. And of course, the contractor has rights of appeal. So right. that is something that, if that's what you're referring to. Okay. And then the last question from this um, participant is who should we contact to discuss setting up bulk uploads from an external database? Uh, that's a very easy question. It has a one-word answer, me. Great. Okay, thank you. And in fact, that. a national lab has already uh, contacted me. I don't, well, I, well this, uh, and I believe has already had, at least on a, some few simple uploads, already had success. Great. And so what we'll do is we'll share your contact information, if you don't mind, with the group so that they're able to reach well, you. It's, it's shared with um, uh, everyone over here on the front page under agency office contacts. I think I am, where's DOE? Uh, here we are. There's Maritza, and um, where am I? I'm further down here. Um, oh, here I am. NIH. All right. Very good. We have a couple more questions still. Sure, go ahead. Question comes from um, Princeton Labs. Um, and I'll read the entire question in its entirety, and if um, I'll maybe connect you with the person if there's some um, follow-up discussion needed. But it says, if a government agency is part of iEdison, we're able to state that agency is the primary funding agency and is and its grant format is acceptable to iEdison in reporting. Isn't reporting via iEdison for this agency considered in compliance with BIDOL? We have yeah. an agency. Okay, so the, but the next question is, we have an agency that fits this model, but who advises they are never involved with iEdison. We have Who's reported, that? I, I don't have that information in the question, but they suggest they have reported many technologies and have assumed reporting compliance. So mm -hmm. maybe I'll just hook you up directly with this person to have a further discussion on that. Sure. We have a written agreement, an MOU, with each and every organization on that front page. Okay. So, but organizations are quite large, and sometimes people change over. And I guess, in theory, they're free to change their minds. We, you know, we uh, we try to be very very kindly about it. But the government is not a. There's no sort of enforcement like this. I mean, they they could choose, I suppose. I mean, I've had some places um, like small organizational components who don't really get any interest in the patent rights prefer to just file it, and then if anybody, you know, on paper. And if anybody wants to come around, which they think will never happen, they can just, you know, assemble something ad hoc at the time. I that's um, I guess I can just call it a um, I don't know how to traditional or um, old. Uh, well, you know what I mean. I I hope. Um, yes. And you know, I I I try to look forward because there's a lot more overlap 
But Edison doesn't allow management of the IP clauses to sort of sit idle because it, it reminds agencies, too, that they have things to do um, and to keep everything straight. And if an agency would rather, um, well, you know what I mean. But we do our level best here at NIH to help any agency, although obviously we can take no role in other agencies' policies or authority, even if we wanted to, which I can assure you we do not. But even if we did, we don't have the time, the expertise, or frankly, the authority. So any right. and all policy decisions, authorities remain right where they always have. Edison merely is a means of compliance that all of the agencies on that front page have a written agreement, and I can I can find them. I know where the cabinet is; they're in my office suite. Um, to use Edison as a means of reporting, so right. if they want to withdraw from that, which I guess they could. Uh, they could just send us another agreement saying we don't want to, and that's that's fine. Um, yes. But I think that with the overall government efforts these days of consolidated databases, that I don't. I think this is the way of the future, in my opinion. Sure, yes. We have four more questions that we're going to go, go through. Um, so this is from uh, the uh, Golden Field Office of the Department of Energy. Is The question is, is there a lag time from when an invention disclosure is uploaded to when another part government agency can review, can view it? No. If something is put into Edison and uploaded there, that government agency and component that has that had its funding cited can see it one second later. Right. There's not then, any lag time whatsoever. Okay. And then their next follow-up question is, does the system automatically notify users and funding agencies for those users that documents have been uploaded so the funding agency may view and accept or reject? Yes. Okay. And then also, if the document isn't accepted or rejected, does the system automatically notify the funding agency again to remind them that there's a document to be viewed? Yes. If the, when a government agent, when a document is uploaded, let's say it's an invention disclosure, a government support statement, which is really a patent application containing a government support statement, uh, and the confirmatory instrument for recordation at the PTO assignment division are recorded, a, uh, an alert is sent to the agency that they have something to review. And if they review it and accept it, well, then it goes away and it's fine. If they review it and, and yes, the submitter can tell. Uh, if the, um, if it is rejected, then it's rejected, and then a message bounces back to the contractor saying, hey, they didn't like it, and there's a reason for the agency to put the reasons why they didn't like it, and then hopefully they can remedy that and put up a new one. The common reasons for rejection for us is they indicated there was a publication in the disclosure document and didn't indicate the date of publication in the invention record to start the statutory bar, which has its own notification message and watches that time frame as well. So um, yes to all those questions. Great. Um, now we have a, a request from um, from Berkeley National. I'm sorry, Brookhaven National Lab. Um, the question is: Could you give us a quick demo on how you connect a parent application with a divisional application? A what application with a divisional application? It would be a um, so if you have an original filing, like a the parent a application provisional filing of a of a non-provisional, and then if you have a divisional created from that um, non-provisional. Let, let me see if I have an example right now. I'm, I'm pulling up a record. Hold on. This one has a lot of patents. Um, in fact, a lar very large number. Just give me one moment. I'm not sure if they're the exact types you're talking about, but if I'll try and make one. Okay, it has all these patents. This is, I think, the one that I think I showed a screenshot of. So let's say I want to modify this. Let's pull it up on Edison Live right now. And then we see uh, they've changed the structure somewhat from the one I've seen, but that's uh, a nice, a little more complicated structure. So um, this isn't the exact type divisional, but I believe this is what you mean, is it not? This particular record here, if we click on it. Yes. And I believe, okay, so now we're looking at it. It gives a little warning. Uh, the parent number here, parent patent docket number, is all fives. Mm -hmm. That is the parent patent docket number here, all fives. So if you then click on this one, it should tell you that its parent, once it comes up, is um, just waiting for it here. Uh, we'll give, we'll point you to this record. So basically, it's a, um, it, it, yes, I hope that answers your question. 
Yeah. Anyway, go ahead to your next one. Yeah, and you the types are indicated um, here, for example. You can pick any of the types you talked about earlier. And some of them change the behavior of the record. For example, if you ind indicate a continuation, you couldn't really have that as the first item in a patent chain because there are no new claims in continuation application. Uh, if you pick a... Um, uh, continuation in part, it will prompt you for a new confirmatory instrument because it's likely that new subject matter is coming in from a different subject invention disclosure, that kind of thing. Great. Yep. And we, we also have um, time for one last question, and this comes from um, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And you might be aware of the database that they're currently using, and if not, maybe they can chime in. But they currently um, are unable to transfer documents directly from the database they're currently using into iEdison. I'm not sure if you're aware of the one that they're currently using or not. Who um, is it? This is Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So oh, Lawrence Berkeley. Yes, what we are, yeah, the document itself. Now, all the information about the document, that is all that's written here, uh, is correct. But the documents themselves are a different matter. That's, we don't have that quite yet. Very, very, very few places have their documents stored in the database. In fact, I believe that is the first I have heard of. However, well, we are currently at the other end of this. We are uh, currently working to get uh, in conjunction with some NIST funding that we have received, all of the federal agencies to get all of their own documents, not just the data, but the documents in bulk. Again, we have to get all this encrypted and everything else. Um, so, but when you're talking about uploading a patent application, it's a very different matter than uploading simple data because a patent application could be, you know, 80, between 50 and 100 pages with high quality images and photographs. And unfortunately, People assume that text files are, or they, they say often assume, are smaller in terms of their need to be uploaded than, let's say, pictures might be. And unfortunately, it's the opposite. The TIFF file format, which is the standard for national patent offices, was picked because the loss tolerance, like a JPEG when you compress it, is much less for a text document than it is in a picture. And therefore, TIFF files are enormous. The difference is very large. And so when you're talking about every single document having an 80-page on the average patent application, um, all text, all TIFF, the file size is enormous. It times out a standard web session. So essentially, because the web session, you know, when you hit submit and wait for the next page to reload, before the document even gets a fraction of the way done, the whole web session times out. That's the problem. They're just too enormous, and there would be loads of them. Patton Edison must have 80,000 or it, Patton Abbey. It's an enormous number. And um, so we're going to have to do something special uh, to handle secure document transmission like that. But we're working on it. Great. Okay, John, well, it's already 3 o'clock. We did have a couple other questions that came through that I'm going to go ahead and um, connect you um, after our webinar. So that That's you guys fine. I'm not pressed if you want to go ahead, but again, I don't want to press your time schedule because you may have commitments. If you want to continue now, I can continue. Well, I'll go ahead and make the email introductions, and you guys can, can finish. Um, they've, they've, uh, these push, uh, individuals have asked questions already, so I think these are follow-up ones that might require more of a discussion. So Okay. Um, but at, at any rate, we'd like to thank you very much for your time and such a thorough and, um, and great overview of iEdison. I wanted to um, let TTWG that we'll be announcing our April webinar shortly. And we also look forward to um, our spring meeting at National Harbor on May 17th. And our registration website will be available shortly as well. So with that, I'd like to again thank John for his presentation and this great overview to iEdison. Thank you, John. Thank you. All right. Thank you, and bye-bye. Thank you. This concludes our webinar.